Um, Robert, you can start now whenever you're ready. All right, that sounds great. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Super, super. Let me get my screen sharing going. And let's go ahead and get started. First of all, Ed, nice job. I really appreciate that. That's a, that's a definitely a great topic, an interesting challenge that I know uh, we all in the OSLC community are, are, are doing to be able to, to build more tools and more connections uh, throughout the industry. So it's good to hear. Um, there'll probably be some things in here that align very well with what, what Ed was talking about of bringing OSLC to life and why we want to be able to bring it to life. So uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different um, in terms of what we usually do at, at some of these vendor sessions. Um, uh, sometimes we do demos, just tools. Um, in this case, I want to talk a little bit why we're supporting OSLC and why we want to support OSLC. So uh, a little bit about us. Um, I'm actually in our Detroit office here in the U.S., but we are a global company here at Sodius Willard. Um, with offices in France and Germany as well. And, and we tend to support the automotive, aerospace, defense, and medical industries. Uh, a lot of these deeply embedded uh, customers are the ones that are focused on traceability. Now, we've been around for 20 some years or so. Uh, and the whole idea that we've been around is around integration. Um, and, and, and this term of integration has been something that organizations have asked about for a long time. And the question is, what do we mean by integration? Because integration typically has been, how do we get data between tools? Um, and, and in general, that's a, a valid answer to be able to look at. Now, the question is, how do we want to do that? And what makes the most sense in us um, being able to do those types of integrations? Now, um, when we started 20 years ago, when we talk about integration, we're really talking about how do we import data? So how do we bring data from one format to another? How do we share it with others? Um, but it's evolved over the last 20 years. And, and we've been part of this in terms of when we moved from importing data to synchronizing data, meaning that I'm taking data from one place to another. I mean, RecIF is probably a good example of that. I need to be able to do a file-based synchronization. Um, some of the other tools like Ops Hub, TaskDob do more dynamic synchronization between uh, between tools. And, and when we're doing that synchronization, we're also asking questions about how often we're doing that synchronization because that tells us how fresh that data is, how consistent that data is, which really gets us to where we want to be or where we think we want to be, which is linked data. Um, linked data is not about synchronization. It's about being able to make sure we have the connections, we have the ability to be able to navigate and Basically, that synchronization is dynamic. It's when we need it, and that's when we can access that data. Um, now, sometimes we get a little bit um, uh, managing of, of terms. Uh, OSLC is a term that we often use synonymously with, with uh, linked data. Uh, that can and cannot be true sometimes. Um, when we're talking about OSLC, like Ed was talking about, we're talking about linked data. We're trying to uh, share information between tools via a link and being able to dynamically get information through covers. Um, there are times and situations where people have used OSLC, me included, uh, when we were doing some doors to DNG migration tools where we use the OSLC interfaces to synchronize or import data. So when we talk about linked data here, I want to focus on, uh, or the usage of OSLC, I want to focus on the usage of OSLC for linking of data. So doing the, the types of things of rich previews, uh, linked information, dialogues to be able to do selections, being able to store only the link and the link relationship, not necessarily the data itself. Now, um, we've also made this was transition. And this transition is moving from, oftentimes we talk about client tools to server tools, but we're also talking about this movement from um, uh, my, my local information, my files to a repository. And so we're moving from this concept of having my data or my information to being able to be an organizational concept in terms of how do we actually share information? How do we uh, let people use it? And what's the scope and persistence in which people use this? And that's where configuration management starts building into this picture of how we work with linked interfaces, linked dialogues and linked data. And really what we were talking about when we talk about OSLC and we're talking about linked data is how do we deal with this problem with, uh, enterprise data management. So this is what organizations are struggling with. And typically, um, when we talk about uh, data itself, we're only talking about the, the data values. 
But in reality, when we talk to enterprise customers, there's a larger set of information that we're dealing with with any of these engineering artifacts. So it's not only the shape of that data or the values of the data, it's who owns that, what's the life cycle of that data, meaning is it current, is it, is it baseline for a particular product, is it orphan or deprecated and no longer intended to be used, what are the permissions and access controls, and, and what's the, the version's history and dependency, because all this data has context. And that's the goal when we're managing this enterprise data. And so we need to, to get to the goals of what, what our, our IT teams and our process teams are looking at is um, how do we manage this data well? And so we want to be able to keep data where it's created because that's where our native semantics are, is where it's going to be best presented in the best context. Um, it's going to be formatted and presented by the, the owning tool, uh, whether it's a client tool or a server side tool. Um, those are the ones that understand the semantics is going to present it the best. Uh, we're also going to be able to manage a single instance of that artifact so that we know the origin, we know uh, who can control it, we can know what versions it is, as well as when we're dealing with a lot of our aerospace and defense customers, um, a single audit path. We need to know who accessed that artifact, when they access that artifact, and how often they access that artifact to be able to make sure that we control that data. And so, um, we also need to have the inverse of that, which is not only uh, control the data where we create it, we also need to have it be referenceable in terms of I can access it from many different places. Um, I always wanted to be up to date. I wanted to be able to present it in a way that is consistent with the, the native format. Um, and we want to preserve that thread, meaning that uh, I want to be able to navigate uh, not just the first instance of artifact uh, that I'm related to, but the next instance of artifacts that I'm related to, meaning that I can follow that digital thread and carry it through. And the only way I can do that is with linked data. Now, um, when we deal with these artifacts, because I'm going to do a little bit of demos and show you uh, a few things. Typically, we're working with two different types of artifacts. One being a workflow artifact, meaning something that has history but no version. Um, but we're going to uh, link to versioned artifacts. And we're going to also look at things that are assets, so things like requirements, test cases. These are things that do have version, they have history, that can be reused in multiple different places. So as we navigate to those artifacts and as we navigate from those artifacts, they're all going to have a version context. Now, um, when we're dealing with linking of data, um, this is the big challenge, and this is the big challenge when we talk about synchronization and why synchronization is hard. Um, when we're linking between artifacts, we always, always need to link to a particular version of an artifact, and that's our context. So when I'm looking at a test, which requirement does it validate to? Not just the, the core requirement of its requirement ID 98, but which version of that? And that's the context of our enterprise configuration. And that, that is something that I think Martin talked very well about yesterday is the needs to be able to have this enterprise configuration concept so I know which version I go to. And that's where synchronization be becomes difficult because we need to be able to manage that version, that indexing to, to the right artifact. Now, um, when we get to synchronizing data, um, we do have some definite values about it. And this is, this is something I think it was eye-opening to us as we've been doing tools, is that um, our users, um, don't care that much about the mechanism in which we make sure that they have data, but they do care about the end results. So when we deal with data synchronization, um, we're definitely dealing with how do we create, update, merge, delete artifacts. So how do we synchronize one source to another? Um, we do this with model information. We do this with pulling requirements into modeling tools. Um, those are kind of standard practices that have evolved over the years. Um, and the reason why they're valuable is primarily this user experience. Our, our engineers that are using these tools find it just valuable to have data that's natively visible. And so um, this is something that's been pretty persistent with synchronization tools. And it, it's the value proposition those synchronization tools have been providing to us um, is that if I'm in a modeling tool and it's imported requirements, whether I'm in Cameo or Rhapsody, uh, whatever tool that I'm using, if it's imported the requirements, I can see the requirements natively. However, I don't have all the details about the requirements. And that, that's the challenge, is doing synchronization is, is wickedly difficult. Understanding the source of truth, where those requirements came from, which version of those requirements, are they up to date, um, is, is, is a challenge. 
having proxies and that's what these elements become proxies they're shadows of those initial artifacts so they don't, they have some of the requirement details but probably not all the attributes and all the details as well as challenges of bi-directionality this is the great thing about link link data is that i can navigate from both sides of that uh, equation so um when i'm in a situation where i'm synchronizing data those tend to be unidirectional uh relationships because not only can I only edit them usually in one direction, but also the linkages are things that are only in one direction. And the biggest issue I think that we see from like an IT or a data management perspective is the moment that we start synchronizing information, we have a security issue in terms of audits, controls, and access controls. Because the moment that I'm copying data from one tool to another tool, what I've done is I moved data. I've copied it to another repository and now its controls are being controlled by another tool and an audit of who can see which data element. Now it's not just controlled by one tool or one repository, but multiple repositories. It's something that that's pretty insidious to be able to manage. Um, as well as we've unfortunately um, introduced when we talk about synchronization, an interesting pattern that allows people to be able to switch domains or switch semantics of artifacts. So a very common one is moving a requirement to something like a story. Um, but those are those are necessary different domains, uh, a requirement uh, telling us things that need to persist or need to happen. A story is telling us the task that we need to implement. And when we switch those domains, we have that conflict in terms of history and versions and how do we manage that? So it's it's difficult for us to do. Um, so we want, what we want to do is we want to link data. Um, and the linking of data is actually uh, fantastic in terms of when we do it right, because now we have a consistent point of access. We have dynamic on retrieval uh, access of values. Um, we have contextualized versions of artifacts when we're using these enterprise configuration management. And so it really addresses the challenge of uh, how do we connect tools? How do we preserve the semantics? What we've often had challenge with even with the, the the wonderful things like rich hovers that we have with oslc is uh the user experience how consistent and how directly accessible is that information and um that is really the target that that's been pressured on us by many of our customers to be able to make our products better and our solutions better while using oslc and we'll, tr we'll try to show a few of those examples as we go through some some demos in here because I can't be a vendor and not show product demos at the same time. So, um, so what's holding back us doing more linking between tools? I think I think uh, Ed did a great job showing if we have the foundation of elements to be able to build these tools faster, um, we're going to get more of these. Um, it really depends on how do we deal with some of these IT topologies and connectivity. So. Um, We've been shocked and surprised at how many IT organizations make sure their servers can't actually talk to each other. Um, so dealing with topologies, dealing with connectivities across local environments, firewalls, clouds, those become a challenge when we're trying to do linking between tools. Um, the user experience in terms of how people interact with tools, what they expect to see. Um, engineers wanna see the, the element that they need to see. Um, they're not necessarily concerned about what are the web protocols that are happening behind it? They're not uh, as concerned about being able to make sure that um, the dialogues are OSLC compliant. They want them to function the way that they want to function. Um, the semantics of these links, um, I, I think Ed was talking about, and I know we've had in the OSLC community a very good conversation about how much of these standardized relationships we want to have and how much of these flexible or customizable relations we want to have. There's more domains than requirements and test cases and changes. So we need to be able to have a larger set of semantics to be able to, to mix those in, as well as ways in which we can restrict down uh, the ways in which people might link for process reasons. Um, and, and we need to be able to get to things like enterprise configuration management. What we found is that being uh, a challenge is how do we actually make this pervasive or consistent with the local tools? Um, so you always have some sort of context, especially in like things like POM tools, and we need to be able to synchronize and make sure that we're all working in that same configuration. And so these are the bundles of things that we're going to have to be able to build. And as we saw with Patrick, as we saw with Ed, they were talking about things like bi-directional linking and backlinking discovery and queries. Um, these are all things that we need to standardize in that community. Now, when we do it right, 
And so what I want to do here is kind of give you a flavor of when OSLC is working the way that it, it should and the way we want it to. Um, and I'm going to do that with actually a mixture of tools. Uh, and I'll try to point out whose tool that we're using when we're doing that. But I think it should give you an illumination of the types of things and the things that, that people are doing to try to make the user experience better and why we like linked data. So the first place I'm going to start here is with Confluence. So Confluence is a tool that, that's uh, very good at being able to share information. Um, the one thing that we want to do in the engineering environment is control how we share that information. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to be able to manage the leaking of information that people shouldn't be able to see. So in here, what we're doing is we're leveraging OSLC with our the, the Sodius Willer OSLC connector for Confluence to be able to make sure I can have access to requirements, but I can have access to requirements only when I'm actually connected to a remote tool. What does that mean? It means that I can share information to people that should have access to that information, but not share information outside of this. This means that I can be able to share requirements within a Confluence page. I can use things like configuration management to be able to control what version of that requirement or that artifact within Confluence so that people have access to information that they need, but you still maintain things like audit control. The other thing that we want to be able to do is make sure as we interact with things like this um, is that we also, and you can see I can do different logins to different things, whether Windchill or Jira, um, is we also want to be able to make sure that when we create content, we create content where we need to create content. For example, if I'm doing a, a meeting here and I have an action item that I want to be able to produce, now it makes sense for me to be able to want to create that artifact within the remote repository I want to store it. So in this case, I might want to create something into uh, EOM. Uh, let's log into EOM first. And I want to be able to make sure that the, the way that I interact with this system allows me to be able to um, create content from dynamically from within Confluence. But then um, when I'm actually updating that data, that's actually persisted in e EOM, so that's in uh, EWM, so that that content can be persisted, it can be updated, it can be accessed from uh, Confluence, from this informal environment, but capturing that formal content. And that's the point, and that's the value of OSLC. We're going to keep things in the native location or controlling who accesses, but still make it visible. Now, another example of what we want to be able to focus on and what we want to be able to do, deal with is that this notion of configurations. So, uh, we talked before about work items. Work items have history, but they don't have version, um, but the links do. And so in this case, it's blending together the concept of how do I do versioning within a change management system? Usually I'm going to use something like a fixed version. So I want to uh, do something in my AMR 1.0 release. That means that the link relationships that I should be doing in terms of what things I want to implement should also be using that configuration. Now, the nice thing here is, is we want to be able to have that experience that people expect. So as you look at this requirement, it's going to tell us the, the requirement that's approved for AMR 1.0, so that configuration. But if I went in here and decided that, wait a minute, this release actually needs to move out to my release two, we want to have those links to be natively contextualized. And you'll be able to see that those links actually, as we... Um, my login apparently timed out when I was talking. Um, it's going to natively go to that new version, that version that's actually of that requirement that's in version 2.0. Now, the nice thing about this, this means is as I'm moving my Jira tickets, um, I'm going to be able to change versions. I'm going to be able to move uh, what release or what sprint that I might be doing in it. And it's always going to index to the right artifact. And that's the value of using linked data. Now I'm going to uh, have a link to the uh, the base resource, but I'm going to set the configuration based on the native versioning that's happening within this tool. So um, when it comes to things like uh, defects or things like that, it's usually going to be using something like DFX version. So looking backwards in time. Um, the other thing that you'll see here that, that it, we're trying to be able to manage with respect to um, what people told us about synchronizing data and having it available all the time is that they get these decorators, these icons to be able to show what status an element is, what priority an element is visually on here. So we don't have to do the rich hover to be able to find that information. 
but it is using the OSLC interfaces in the background to add those decorators. So it's pulling additional information from those tools. And so as you, as you can see, as I move between different releases, it's going to automatically update not only the, the requirement itself, but also those decorators. So I can see attribute information from those foreign resources. So that's how we're getting, getting that balance of information back and forth. But it's not just us that are trying to be able to add those capabilities as well. If you look at something like Siemens Polarian, which is a tool that we interact with, with our OSLC Connect for JIRA, um, you're going to see that it adds additional context. So it, it understood that what people want to be able to see is that remote data. So this remote data in this case is this JIRA artifacts, um, their IDs, their status, their priority, other elements about them simply by using that linked data. So if I go in here and when you set up your environments prior to a demo, you always tend to log out in the middle of it. Um, but if we go to add another uh, link relationship in here, um, what you'll be able to see is that we're going to go ahead and um, be able to pull uh, a new item. A new item is going to be uh, dynamically brought to us by uh, the tool here and be able to make sure that we do things like pick the right element. You'll see that we'll match stories, and that's why it's actually going to show us linkable. So this is our, our user interface to be able to make sure when you're picking Jira tickets, you're picking the right items. And then you'll see that the way that Polarian works, it's going to know that, oh, we have this new element, so we're going to be able to make sure that we pull this table and have this information visible to you. This is dynamic information, but it's presented the way the users want it. So it's leveraging OSLC, but giving that kind of feel that we're consistent with with um, linked data or with, with synchronized data to be able to present that. Now, the other things that, that we want to do, and as we're running out of time, I want to be able to be kind of quick about it. Um, we're going ahead and being able to use OSLC to be able to bring more information to life. And so uh, we might have things like this. So you see in doors next, we can see information of Jira tickets from, from our solution. You're also going to be able to see on artifacts themselves, things from Windchill. So this is actually uh, our OSLC Connect for Windchill adapter that allows us to be able to contribute uh, Windchill configurations into uh, the IBM environment and show these as AM resources. And if we actually want to uh, navigate over to that artifact, we would be able to see that that artifact also participates as well as leverages um, a global configuration. So you can see how it's using a particular global configuration to contextualize these other elements, as well as it shows why we want to do more than synchronization. If we synchronized elements, we might be able to see elements like the DVD ROM drive here in uh, doors next. But now we can navigate over to Windchill and then I can navigate back over to ETM and be able to have a full life cycle and just follow the chain through. And that's what we really mean by that digital threat, which gets to that, that other broader concept here is that we need to be able to do reporting across this. And this is where it's uh, fantastic to be able to use things like um, uh, the TRS feeds within these tools that allows us to be able to build reports that are cross domain. So we can see things like requirements from doors next uh, with your issues, or even we could see something uh, where with us providing the TRS feeds to uh, the IBM's LQE service, we see things like windchill artifacts. So these are actually windchill change artifacts along with Jira issues, as well as with uh, things like EWM issues, all in the same report. So um, we get that balance between that link data, but then reporting on that link data into an index to be able to do reporting on that entire graph of information and, and thoughts and capabilities. And now I know that I'm running kind of short on time here, um, and I want to be able to get to, to some questions if we can. So let me just kind of do a, a couple, couple um, kind of wrap up type things that, uh, that we want to focus on. Number one is being pragmatic. So uh, we talk about linked data and synchronized data are just life of how we're operating right now. Um, but we need to be pragmatic. Um, synchronization can be useful. Um, we know with legacy client tools, um, you're, you're oftentimes going to have to synchronize data, whether it's synchronizing data from an OSLC data source or just another tool to be able to bring that data in. We have to be realistic in how we do that. Um, but we also want to be able to make sure that um, uh, we focus on how people are, are interacting with it and whether or not the workflow is consistent with how they, how they need to interact so that we need to control um, when they synchronize 
and what they know about that synchronization so they know that those those um, uh, elements are consistent and valid. Um, the, the other type of situation that we know that synchronization is always going to happen today is things like air gaps for security or vendor exchange. Um, I'd love to be able to see vendor, vendor exchange to be more linked data, um, but we're going to uh, take a couple steps before we get there. So, so there always is going to be some level of synchronization across that boundary in terms of organizations or entities be able to make that happen. Now, linked data is wickedly valuable and we should look at it more and more for server to server interaction um, and to create this engineering web thread of data. And it's it, if preserving security is important to your team, you need to take a serious look at this because this is the best way to be able to preserve security because you're always going to be interacting with uh, a native user and have that auto control. Um, I know that there are some OSLC implementations that are currently using uh, kind of like super users to be able to synchronize data, um, but we want to be able to make sure that you you take a look at those OSLC interfaces so it's always using your own user ID to access that, that information. Um, and definitely uh, take a look at what Martin was talking about yesterday about uh, enterprise configuration management, something that I've been talking about for years. It was, it was great to be able to see uh, voiced from a customer as strongly as that as well. Um, being able to have versioning of those artifacts and having links that index with the version are imperative for the future. Now, um, focus on the user user experience. The more the best user experience is what people are going to adopt, whether it's synchronized data or linked data. Um, we want to have the properties of linked data, so make our linked uh, data interfaces much better. Um, uh, and when we're using synchronized data, manage uh, the concept of shadows, meaning those proxies. What a what a are the replicated content and how does everybody know what content is being replicated? So there's some things to be careful about and things that we, we need to work on. As well as when we work look at OSLC, there's obviously some things that we wanna see some growth on. Uh, consistency implementation. I know that uh, all of our vendors are trying our best to be able to build solutions that work well together and that's what the OSLC community is about. Um, we're also looking at being able, how do we deal with things like uh, authentication authorities? Because so we have consistent uh, authentication across the different tools and lifecycle. The flexible domains, I know we've been talking about, it, I heard Ed talk about in the last talk. Um, and then uh, some additional activities that we should be looking at. So I know that I am like right close to the end. So um, if there's questions, I'm happy to answer them um, and want to be able to make sure we stay on time here. Hi, Robert. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really like these link decorators. They definitely improve the, the user experience. Um, there is a, There are two questions from Slack. Um, first one is, when you talk about linked data, is it mostly between IT systems or can it also be within one system? And I'll read out the second question, which is, what are the most common ways of linking with OSLC as a good option? The, the most common ways to be able to link with uh, with OSLC, the, the most common ways are going to be the native tool support and the native domain support. Um, so you saw some some uh, modifications of things that I was doing um, and, and it kind of feeds into both um, what, what was being talked about earlier about the product domain. Um, so within uh, to, to support Windchill right now, um, we're supporting the, uh, the architecture management domain for uh, Windchill parts, which isn't necessarily absolutely consistent, but it is necessary to be able to have these tools be able to talk together. So the best way to be able to have uh, support for OSLC today is um, having native tool support within the same uh, tooling uh, technology that you have, uh, as well as having um, support for the common standard domains. Um, as we see things like uh, the, the mid team, and I know Siemens has flexibility as well, supporting more flexible domains. Um, that's going to be great because then we have more link types and more concepts. Um, but until then, staying with that. And and I apologize as I started talking about this, the, the second question, what was the first question again? Uh, the first question was if it would make sense to apply linked data within the same system, not just across different IT systems. So I, I think it does. Um, so one of the challenges that I didn't talk about there that I know uh, is persistent uh, across tooling is when we mix linking uh, concepts. So um, 
when we when we uh, are using OSLC, it is it is extremely valuable for us to be able to have all linking in the same concept because of reporting. Uh, we want to be able to have the same uh, synchronized concept of how we do linking. We want to have the same synchronized concept of how I do versioning so that as I navigate through my uh, engineering thread, I'm consistent. So we need to have this concept of a OSLC enterprise session, meaning what configuration I'm operating in and all my links need to uphold that and, and stay in there. So as much as possible, um, if these tools can natively support OSLC for all linking, um, that is best. I mean, we, we take a look at something like the IBM EOM suite. Uh, it's natively built on OSLC so that when I navigate between those links, I'm always using my enterprise GC. Um, if I look at something like, and, and, and this is not, um, it, it's just a, a manifestation of where we're at in the industry. When I look at uh, some of my other tools that are adding OSLC to them, um, when we have a mixed mode, of uh, linkages so things like in ptc i know we do a lot of different versioning information about links some links include a version some links float to the current um configuration and some things are oslc configured and so um as i navigate those it becomes a challenge for a user both to understand what versioning i'm using um, but also how to be able to do reporting in a consistent way. So as much as possible, getting to one standard way to be able to do linking, one standard concept of doing configuration that either maps to the OSLC enterprise configuration or is exactly that OSLC configuration, those things are going to be, be wickedly important for reporting and user experience. Okay. Thank you very much, Robert. We, we need to move on to the next speaker. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Uh,